Absolutely. Uh, James Lutton here with Richard T. Sloan, a well-known, renowned, world-famous artist in the boxing world. And today we're going to discuss your stories and your journey with Joe Fraser. Um, talk to me a little bit about how you first met Joe when he came over to England when you was just a teenager. Yeah, it was, um, it was, I think the movie came out in 88 towards 89, but there was a movie called, a film called uh, Champions Forever, which many fight fans of uh, my generation would remember, featuring George Foreman, Kenny Norton, Muhammad, and uh, Smoking Joe. And uh, it was a great movie. Um, it had a dollar career, so so they were on a tour, and uh, Kenny had uh, not was not able to make uh, the English leg of the tour, but Mohammed, Joe, and George did, and um, I was training at the Thomas A. Beckett, and I, I, I knew that these guys were going to be in town, but I had no idea that I would have the opportunity to meet Joe Frazier who I'd written to as a child, and he was always one of my idols. And I thought somebody was winding me up. They said, you know, Joe Frazier's come up the stairs. And I thought, you know, bullshit. So I kept hitting the bags, and sure as hell, it was Joe Frazier. And, um, but it was halfway through a round, so I was there to, to work out. So I finished the round. Everybody else stopped, but I finished the round. Certainly not to be disrespectful to him, but, uh, but that actually impressed him. Um, again, I didn't do it for that either. I just did it because finishing a round is, is important. And, um, yeah, we after the round ended, we, we started chatting, and he showed me some stuff and exchanged numbers and uh, started a friendship that that ended with me carrying him in, in his casket to, to his grave. I was one of the pole bearers, and he became a father figure, a best friend. But um, from that first day at the Thomas A. Beckett to the last day at Ivy Hill Cemetery, we shared a hell of a lot of memories, and that's what we're here to talk about. Absolutely, and we're gonna we're gonna speak about some of these memories. Um, talk to me first of all. You mentioned there Thomas A. Beckett. You was training, working out, and Joe Fraser walks in. Now, by the end of the time when he was over in England, you had come to an agreement that you would travel out to see him in America and yeah, he, train under his tutelage. Yeah, that's correct, James. He, he, he had said, um, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't really, the, well, he said I wasn't making a living with boxing at that point. Obviously, he had his family uh, fight, um, nephews and, and Marvis and, and Joe Jr., um, uh, who was actually, uh, his real name was Hector, but he formed the smoking Joe Junior for uh, Vinny Pazienza, Marvis, we all know, only had two losses as a pro, one Larry Holmes, one to Mike Tyson, um, and he had two, two, two nephews, Rodney and Mark, and then later his daughter, Jackie, fought Layla, but, um, but at that time, yeah, George just really trained family, and uh, he had some fighters uh, back at his gym in Philly, but he was more of a community center, so he wasn't really scouting fighters, he was just... Um, I, I think because I knew a lot about his career and and I was just um, just really, you know, kind of blown away and, and humbled by his presence. Um, you know, he gave me a phone number and said, if you want to fight for me, you know, you got to give me a call sometime. And I'm sure he thought I'd never call for that. But a week later, I said, I'm ready to go. And he said, have you finished school? I said, nope. He said, well, you got to at least finish school. He said, how old are you? I said, well, I'm about 15 years old. And he said, it's too young. Um, he said, you got to, you know, finish school at least. And, and in America, usually they finish when they're 18. But as you know, in England, it's like 16. And um, so I did. I, I finished school. But before those results came in, I was... Uh, I was on the plane and, and landing in Philadelphia, so to this day, I still don't know how I did you know, on my uh, secondary school report. <laughs> Probably got all, 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 all Ds, maybe, maybe an artwork, I might have not, not got a D, but I didn't care too much for school. 
talk to me a little bit about how you managed to get the money to fly out to Philadelphia. That's a great question. Um, I had, uh, and my mother is captain, I'm sure they're all, they're all worn away now, but I had a, a video library of fights and I would trade videos and um, that was one of my forms of income. And, uh, you know, we're farm boys, so I'd, I'd work on the farm, um, other farms, and uh, pick up jobs here and there. Uh, father was a blacksmith, so I'd, I'd help him out. But the main thing was uh, I would sell merchandise for Marvin Hagler. When I was in my teens, I was the only distributor. And again, in England, in my, in my mother's attic, there's boxes and boxes of brand new Marvin Hagler merchandise that didn't sell because I didn't have a budget for advertising and things like that. And um, I sold what I could to friends and family and, and traveled as far as I could trying to sell it. Um, so, so yeah, I sold, sold videotapes. I ended up selling my TV at the time. I had a, a video cassette player that would record one video to another. Um, so that um, everything I had, and I arrived in America with forty bucks in my pocket. And Ramon, what I'm, not sure, was... I'm not sure it was forty pounds or forty dollars, but it was it was forty. I think it was forty dollars after I changed it over. And I remember being at the airport and being really thirsty and thinking, "Man, that can of coke looks really good," but that's that's about five percent of my worth. So I, I just drank drank uh, water out the toilet. Not the toilet bowl, but out of the bathroom, you know. And and what, what year was this? This was 1990. Yeah, August of 1990. I still somewhere have the... Uh, I flew out of Gatwick, I believe, uh, and somewhere I still have the little rail, rail pass. I spent the night at the... Um, I got one room at... Um, I think it's a hotel, it was in Piccadilly Circus, uh, a little hotel, I forget the name of it, it's no longer in business, but I stayed there in, in a room, didn't even have a bathroom, just a little small room, and then uh, got up, got a rail pass, took it to uh, Gatwick, and and that was it. I got to the US, where they opened up the bag, they saw boxing gloves and everything, they said, said um, you know, you can't fight here. You know, our visas, I said, I understand that, I'm just coming to train. And I did have a letter from Joe Frazier, and um, I showed him the letter, and they said, okay, well, how are you going to support yourself? Um, and, I, and, you know, you only have $40, uh, how are you going to do it? And I said, this is America, man, I've seen all the movies, I've seen, I've been Death Wish with uh, Charles Bronson, I said, everybody gets robbed. I said, I said we're going to, uh, people will send the money. I said, I don't want to, you know, and, and the guy kind of laughed, and... But, you know, nobody was sending any money. And luckily when I got to Philadelphia, Joe took care of me. Talk to me a little bit about the moment you got off or out of the airport in Philadelphia. Um, you know, you've this is something you've wanted to do. You're 16 years old. You want to train. You're going to train with Joe Fraser. Um, so yeah, well, it's the, the flight that I got, and, and like I said, those, you know, I'm, I'm almost 50 years old now, so those in my generation will, will, will remember the days before the internet, um, there was little advertisements in the back of the newspaper, so I bought a flight from there that was really cheap. And um, But it took me to Detroit. No, it took me to Boston first, but I wasn't allowed to leave the airport. But I knew that's where, you know, the Haglers and Petronellis were at. Then it took me to Detroit uh, on a connection flight, and I was stuck in the airport in Detroit, and then to Philly. And when I got to Philly... Um, I got off the plane and Marvis Fraser was waiting for me. And, and, and at this point, I was already ex totally exhausted. So it, it was almost um, like living in a dream. Uh, and there was Marvis Fraser, And we go outside and get in his old, old Cadillac, like a really long Cadillac, uh, probably like a 76 DeVille or something. And, and, uh, and we start talking and Marv realized how sleepy I am. So... He was just uh, got knocked off the conversation and started playing the harmonica, and that even seemed more like a dream. I'm like this dude playing the harmonica, and uh, to all Marv's credit, the greatest guy on the walks the planet, but he can't play the harmonica. Oh, shit. 
<laughs> it, was, uh, it was funny. It was, uh, it was uh, classic. So I, I got to the gym, and Joe was there with Bert Watson, actually, who's famous for his UFC um, announcing. And, 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 well, actually, he's, like, uh, fighting relationships with WBC, but Bert was helping Joe at that time, and I think he even had the title as Joe's business manager. So Bert and Joe were there. So the first day I got here, um, Bert, who is now, uh, he said he's in all kinds of Hall of Fames for his involvement with MMA, but at that time he just, just started with boxing. He was also in London with Joe, too. No, you, you so, so I've known Bert, yeah, I've known Bert as long as I've known Joe, but obviously, you know, I didn't live with Bert, didn't know him close like I knew Joe. Mm-hmm. Now, you, you arrived in Philadelphia at 16 to train alongside or train under the tutelage of Joe Fraser. What was he like to learn from? You know, at first, at first, he was so hard on everybody, like every fighter. And Marvis, um, just being 16, Marvis, who, who had just finished up his career, I think he, a year before, Marvis went out on a win. I mean, he, like I said, he only lost two fights as a pro and, and had a great amateur career. I just want to give Marvis the credit for being a great fighter because people kind of look at him as a laughing stock or, or they don't give him the credit because of the, the brawl with Mike Tyson and, and Larry Holmes. But other than those two fights, he beat so many people. So Marvis just coming to the end of his career, which included a tremendous amateur career. He just beat Phil Brown. So Marv was still in shape. But Marv took me under his wing at first and then Joe was really really hard on me um and I thought you know like Joe's just like nobody could ever befriend Joe Frazier like like this man does to just um doesn't really laugh or give you any chances it's like if you run uh, I mean there's no there's no well done son um unless you've earned it like, like he's not trying to sugarcoat anything and that was Joe Frazier but once you earned his respect, which finally I did, we were literally like brothers or father and son. And, you know, wherever he went, I, I was there. And, and um, I was his pride and joy because I worked so hard to emulate him, uh, his style, which I could certainly do on the heavy bag, certainly do on, on any, any mitts, that kind of stuff. You would think you would think it was uh, a Joe Frazier um, robot, but uh, or clone, but but the truth is, in the ring, you know, nobody can emulate Joe Frazier. He's he's got so many, so, and I tried to, but you know, I, I'm not Joe Frazier. And so you got out there at 16. How long had you trained with him? I trained with Joe, um, and then I was made offer to go to to Kronk. So, I, uh, but but. With Joe, I had a handshake deal, and Joe did give me the chance. And um, Emmanuel wanted to train me, and um, you know the Kronk was thriving. So, so I said, you know, let's let's go now together, uh, Joe and I. I said, I said you know, maybe because to me, being a boxing, a young boxing historian at that point, um, I knew a corner of Joe Frazier and Emmanuel Stewart would be would be ideal, but. Joe didn't like the option, and uh, in hindsight, I don't think it would have worked. Um, but I did go to Kronk after, let's say, 10 years with Joe, uh, about 2000. Uh, yeah, 2000, I actually went and, and stayed at Kronk uh, towards Lennox at Fort, Holyfield in 99 in, uh, at the Garden. So about that time, I was living full-time in Detroit. But prior to that, but I never boxed for Kronk because I kept my word to Joe. I never, ever, ever have laced up gloves in the Kronk gym. No, one time. Not, not, uh, yeah, not even sparring. I haven't even, I haven't even hit the bags in the Kronk gym because, you know, Joe didn't want that. And he said, you're going to be like the rest of those guys that I taught how to fight and leave. And he was referring to guys like Melvin Taylor, who, who won the Olympic gold while training at Joe Frazier's gym. And uh, and many other guys that yeah, you know, but the same happened to Emmanuel. It was professional boxing. These these guys get to a certain level and then they they jump ship. And uh, Joe, I know it would have broken Joe's heart because um, he really did give me a chance when when nobody else did. 
now obviously you so you'd left show after ten years. Um, but I left. I left. I, I quit. I quit boxing after ten years. Um, I, I refused to fight for anybody else. And, and once I, yeah, I, I mean Joe Frazier is the only guy that ever ever trained me to fight. Um, of course, I learned techniques from Emmanuel and picked his brains. But you know, I knew I was never gonna fight for anybody other than Joe Frazier. Did you have a different relationship with Joe once you stopped training? Was it more a friendship after that point? Yeah, like like at that time, yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Well, actually, he still wanted me to to, to get back, and um, the last time he was in Vegas, which was which was around Mayweather and Ortiz, he stayed at the South Point Hotel, which anybody knows Vegas is they know it's way south. It's not really even on the strip. It's Las Vegas Boulevard, but it's it's ten minutes south of the sign that says "Welcome to Vegas." Um, so Joe was out there because he knew somebody that that was a gaming host and got him a nice suite and, and uh, he was there. And, but right up until that point, which I don't know what that year was, maybe 2011. Um, so for 10 years after walking out of Joe Frazier's gym to help Emmanuel, um, Joe was, was you know, saying, hey, it's not too late. You can still make a comeback. You can still do this. You can still do that. And when I finally saw him the last time, I said, I said you ready? I said, I think I'm ready, Smoke. And he, and he laughed. He said, no, nah, son, leave it alone. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we had a really fun friendship. And, uh, you know, he liked to hang out. He would call it the wild thing. He was, uh, so we'd go do the wild thing, which which usually meant going to a little hole in the wall, listening to some James Brown and Bobby Womack and, uh, you know, have a couple of couple of cognacs and you know shoot some pool and you know Joe was a ladies man I think people are aware of that um, so we, we uh, yeah we became hangout buddies I just wanna, <clears throat> excuse me um, before I move on to more of the good times I just want to fast forward you mentioned at the start of the course so he was a pool bearer at his funeral um, just want to sort of get into how much he meant to you and how devastating his passing was to yourself. Well, put it this way, I, I can't I can't go back to Philadelphia, um, and, and even being I'm, I'm actually sitting in Detroit right now. I came back to help the kids here at, at the Cronk Gym and spent spent some time with friends, and and I have a daughter in, in Detroit, so I'm I'm, I'm here. But Phil, and, and it's really hard for me to be here because there's no Emmanuel here, um, and Philadelphia. I just. Uh, I'm invited to go to a Atlantic City Hall of Fame on the 7th of October, and uh, I would have to fly into Philly. And of course, if I go to Philly, there's so many of Joe's family and stuff there that, that I would feel obligated to see and I would love to see. Um, so I don't know if I'm ready. And, and, and you know, Joe has passed now, or well, this November will be 11 years, and Emmanuel on the 25th of October will be 10 years. So, so to be here, it's taken me 10 years to kind of be able to go around Detroit but even around Detroit I find myself taking pictures to send to people that that were there like uh, at this, Manuel's favorite little supermarket I just stumbled across it and I was like oh shit this is Manuel's I remember this place and you know some of the names on these buildings have changed but last night I just had a sandwich at his favorite Mediterranean place so so the memories of, of both of these guys um uh, ten years later, uh, just, you know, still very fresh to me, and uh, and uh, yeah, anybody that's lost a loved one, and that's what these guys were to me and are to me, uh, and I still keep their legacy going whenever I can, and that's I wouldn't be doing this call if it wasn't for for Joe Frazier, you know, I mean, he did so much for me that. I can never forget it, and I'll never let anybody forget the way the, you know the man I knew. So, so that's where I'm at now. I'm just just at the point where I realize, you know, we all gotta someday die, and uh, it's what you leave behind, and, and the way you make people feel is is so important. And he was a hell of a man, and I miss him every day. Everybody knows you as the artist. 
the guy who's painted the posters, the, the program covers. Now recently there was a front cover over here on Boxing News magazine. Um, I think it was the 50th year anniversary of um, Ali Fraser. And you had painted the cover. For yourself, what is it like to paint and immortalise Joe Fraser? Well, it's been hard. I've been asked and I've actually been commissioned and, and turned it down. I, I, I haven't painted Joe since he... Uh, I hadn't painted Joe since he passed away. Like I said, it's just it was just too hard. And then... Um, Ring Magazine were doing a, a tribute to the Ali Frazier 50th anniversary and asked me to do the cover. At first, I my usual response was no you know i'm not not paying joe um but then i gave it some thought and i thought you know what this is a chance for me to really give the, the man some respect in a in a magazine that he had appeared on many many covers and um i also chose to do it in leroy neiman's style because because leroy you know was more of a muhammad fan um because muhammad was commercially, uh, well, maybe it was just more popular generally. I mean, I'm sure that's the general consensus. I, I know it's a consensus. But to me, you know, Joe was the man. And uh, no disrespect at all to Muhammad. You know how close I am with the Ali's, Nico, and their beautiful family. But Joe, Joe was my guy. So, in Neiman's style, because Joe never thought that Neiman gave him a fair shake. If you look at most of the paintings Neiman did, it's Joe getting busted up, or Joe, you know, Joe actually used to say that Neiman purposely made him look like a gorilla, um, which, you know, is part of Muhammad's uh, stick, or stick, or like, you know, the gorilla and Manila and all that stuff. Um, so uh, I got the pen in Neiman style, uh, and, and uh, I had Joe knocking, well, hitting Ali with the punch, and then Ali on the ground, which is the only paint I've ever put three fighters on. I mean, there's three images on there. Um, there's the left hook getting landed, and then there's also Ali on his ass, and that's, uh, that was done strictly for respect for Smoking Joe. Somewhere, I, you know, I, I'm not a big... A religious man or anything like that, but but if 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 he's looking upon it, he's going to say, you know what, Rich took care of me. Absolutely, I'm sure he is. I'm sure he is. And uh, Richard, the last question from me, um, as we've spoken many times before, you know, I like to end on this question: What is your favourite memory of Joe Fraser? My favourite memory of Joe Fraser. Um, There's so many. There, 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 there really is so many. But, but I'll come up with something that that's relatable to a lot of people. I mean, a lot of them are, you know, you'd have to really know the backstory to to, 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 to grasp it. But I'll come up with a funny memory. Early on, um, we are driving to New York City for an event, and um, he stops and gets KFC, which was one of his. Uh, one of his, really the only drive through he'd go through, so Kentucky Fried Chicken, and he also had some bananas and stuff, because we were running late, so, so he grabbed some stuff to eat in the car. And we're, we're heading up the highway, doing about 80, he's got his music blasting, windows down, it's a beautiful day, and he's throwing, uh, he's eating these chicken wings and throwing the bones out the window. And I'm still, this is early on, so I'm still shy, and then, and, and, you know, I don't want to eat his food. But he says, come on, man, you haven't eaten. Eat something. And I was bashful, and I said, all right, I said, maybe i get a banana. So, so I eat a banana, and he's over there chewing away the chicken, throwing out the window as it's done. So I rolled the window down and threw the, threw the skin out, the uh, banana skin. And, and he looked at me, and he, he said, what the hell's wrong with you? I said, what do you mean? He, he said, you thought so, this ain't your country? He, he, he said, do you live in your own country? And, and he was serious. And, and I said, uh, it's biodegradable, man. I was like, it's going to, you know, a truck's going to run over it or an animal. And he said, no, man. He was like, he was like, uh, put your trash in the bag in the future. And, and so it was, it was funny because he was a little hypocritical, but, but uh, it just, um, 
it just, I don't know, it, it showed me that he was a patriot and, and, and he viewed at that time as a, me as just being a guest of America. And uh, that's just a, a, a funny memory of, of I guess, that him, him. I don't think he trusted me really at that time, but then, then we broke through that. Um, but that's a vivid memory. I, I do remember, I do remember that. And, and we laughed about it a long time ago like many years later we'd, we'd sit and talk about it whenever he'd throw something away i'd, I'd kind of emulate his uh, speech so so we, we enjoyed that ongoing joke for for a long time fantastic well, richard i want to firstly thank you for your time but also thank you for sharing your stories with joe fraser yeah, James, and I want to thank you for everything you're doing for boxing and and, uh, and bringing you know, you know giving people like me a chance to to voice some of the great times and you know it's guys like you that love boxing and have the passion for boxing that that keep this thing going. You guys are the engine of this sport, so I want to thank you for everything you do for boxing. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate you. Thank you, Richard. All right, my friend. We'll speak soon. You take care. Thank you.